Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our journey through the Bible. We're going to keep our focus today on Paul's letter to the Philippians. There's something, something of a, a confluence of these readings with a few recent conversations that really highlighted a, a particular portion of the third chapter of this letter. So I want to spend some time on that today. This third chapter begins with some warnings about the, the detrimental influences that existed for those in the church. Beware of the dogs, Paul says. But then Paul go, gets into a little recollection of his own personal history. He speaks of the, the difference between being confident in God through Jesus and being confident in one's own accomplishments and abilities, which he refers to as confidence in the flesh. And then he goes on in that context of confidence in the flesh to review some of his own history. This is Philippians 3, the second half of verse 4 through verse 6. He says, If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Now this, this brief paragraph here, and we're going to read more in a few minutes, but this brief paragraph highlights a key element of, of Paul's journey. Paul was uniquely suited for his role in the building up of the church in a way in that, in that he was both a Jew and a Roman citizen. This gave him certain rights and protections as a Roman citizen as he traveled from location to location, but also as a Jew gave him credence when he would enter and when he would encounter his, his Jewish audiences. That notion of God using one's particular gifts and circumstances for a greater purpose is a notion worth plenty of thought on its own, but we're just going to leave that there for now because it's in the words that follow. It's that final line that stands out in what comes next. As to the law, Paul writes, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. In the midst of this diatribe about his worthiness according to the flesh, Paul highlights his history of terrorizing the earliest believers. Now everyone knows, of course, that history, but, but it still stands out that he would bring such a reminder into the midst of this argument of his own worthiness. But then he goes on. I'm going to skip a couple of verses and then pick up in verse 10, and I'll read through verse 16. Paul writes, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has, has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind and if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. I do not consider that I have made it my own. But this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. In the same flow of arguments in which Paul highlights a truly devastating history of fighting against the gospel, Paul continues on with such a simple and yet profound claim. 
This one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. In the wake of of this past Sunday's sermon on forgiveness, I actually found myself in a number of conversations about the topic. Twice, however, those discussions came around to that classic mantra of forgive and forget. I've always suggested that that's a, a, a risky concept when it comes to our call to forgiveness because it implies that forgiveness inherently means that life goes on as though nothing ever happened. Forgiveness doesn't work that way. There is still sometimes repercussions. Re- relationships can be built, but they aren't always immediately restored to what was. I could go on, but... But the forgive and forget notion comes with an underlying implication that we're supposed to act like nothing ever happened at all. And I just, I don't think it works that way. Except that in Christ, it does. In another one of these conversations, one of our members was was sharing a story of a time in which in which they felt particularly guilty about something they had done. They were struggling with it, and they came to God with a contrite heart in prayer. This individual opened up to God about what had happened, apologized, and and sought forgiveness. And as they did so, they felt God speaking within them, saying, What are you apologizing for? I, I don't even know what you're talking about. It was a spiritual affirmation for this individual that that God's grace is so great and mercy so abundant that it is as though these things never happened at all. Forgive and forget is not how it works in our forgiveness of others. And yet in Christ, it is. This one thing I do, Paul writes, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. In in his typically convoluted language, Paul is making a two-part argument here. First, the achievement of our glory is not ours. There's no such thing as being confident in the flesh, confident in the flesh. We we don't reach the goal by our merit. Paul accentuates that even further by by pointing to those times in which his own ability to be confident in the flesh were times at which he was, in truth, acting directly contrary to the gospel. The achievement of our glory is not ours. The goal is reached through the mercy of God in Jesus the Christ. That's that's point one. Point two, however, is that because we have reached that goal, because Christ Jesus has made us his own, forgiven and forgotten has become our reality. God has not only forgiven our errant ways, but God has, in Christ, removed the repercussion and restored the relationship to the point that it is as though it never happened in the first place. This one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Paul's claim here is not his own, but but the fundamental promise that God in Christ has created a new reality in which the old is forgotten and the future is wide with promise and possibility. That's the love, the grace, and the mercy that holds us. We are forgiven, and it is forgotten. Whatever we've done, God will reply as though he doesn't even know what we're talking about. And so Paul's point is, we can look to tomorrow without worrying about yesterday. Because in God, it is as though those errors of yesterday never happened at all. Let's be in prayer together. God of abundant grace, words cannot express our gratitude 
for the mercy we know in you. For the gift of looking towards tomorrow without the worries of yesterday, of knowing that our future is forever held in you. Hear us, God, as we own our missteps of the past and then guide us as we look forward to that which we know you have in store in all the days yet to come. For we pray in his name. Amen. Thank you once again for being with me. We're, we're coming down the home stretch here, just a couple of these left, and I appreciate all the time we've shared together. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon, and I'll see you Thursday at noon.